I'd like to start by just asking you to uh, do a little exercise with me. I'd like you to think about a childhood memory. Just picture that childhood memory in your mind's eye. Do you have it? What kind of memory? It's up to you. <laughs> OK, raise your hand if that memory had something to do with the outdoors. Look around the room. This is a choir that we're speaking to here, but I have to tell you that almost every time that I ask that question of any kind of audience, most hands go up, at least an adult audience. But I can tell you that if we were to ask that question of today's youth, like 30 years from now, far fewer hands would go up. And the reason for that is that there's a growing trend towards kids being disconnected from the natural world. And we know that some of our best memories are formed in being outdoors. And so they're missing out on, on that piece of nostalgia. But what we're going to talk about today is more than nostalgia. It's also about the evidence of why it's important to connect kids to nature and what various parts of our, our community, our sectors, can do uh, to connect kids to nature. So let, let me start ask, uh, by talking basically about what the plan is for today. So the plan is um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the research on the benefits, just briefly. I'm going to do a little overview of what some of the challenges are to connecting kids to nature. And then we're going to talk about sort of action. And I'm going to give three examples of different parts of our society, different sectors, uh, that can do something um, to connect kids to nature. And then my colleague, Sarah milligan Toffler from Children and Nature Network is going to step in and give a little bit of a national perspective um, and also moderate some discussion. Um, she can answer questions, I can answer questions, et cetera, at the end. So why connect kids to nature? So while the research is really sort of in a nascent stage, there is a lot of emerging evidence um, that suggests that connecting kids to nature is beneficial to them in almost all parts of their life. And even though that research is still in its emergent form, there's enough research that's all pointing in the same direction that we can act. We don't really need to wait until all of the research is in that thoroughly understands all parts of this. We can act on what we have now, as well as continue to research where the gaps are. So what are these benefits? So um, the health benefits are well documented, particularly around physical activity. When kids are outdoors playing, they have more room to roam, running is the sort of norm, and they're simply more, more active. And that, of course, helps with obesity, helps with you know, cardiovascular and respiratory health, um, and decreases the risk factors for later health outcomes. There's a little bit less evidence on some of the other health benefits, things like myopia, vitamin D deficiency. Um, some of that is simply about being outdoors and being exposed to the sun. Myopia also has to do with where your focus is. If you're focusing on a computer screen or a device, you are not getting enough exposure to focusing in the distance. And being outdoors allows you to focus at a distance. There's also um, mounting evidence for mental health benefits. Um, being in nature is a stress buster. Um, and it helps decrease symptoms of depression and anxiety. Um, kids also benefit in their emotional development from having time outdoors. Um, they have experiences which allow them to develop self-esteem um, and self-confidence. Um, they improve their focus, their attention, their emotional regulation. We'll talk in a minute about um, regulatory functions or executive functions. That has to do with emotional regulation. And basically, these times outdoors allow kids to develop that regulatory ability. We're going to talk more about this learning and educational piece when I talk about what can sectors do, because we're going to talk about the education sector um, a little bit more at length. But basically, there is um, mounting evidence that um, when kids are learning outdoors, they are increasing their actual subject matter or disciplinary skills and knowledge base, like math skills. You know, they'll do better in math, they'll do better in English, they'll do better in science, that sort of thing. Also sort of markers of achievement, you know, standardized tests, grade point averages, attainment like graduation, those sorts of things are all um, enhanced by having time outdoors and learning outdoors. Also behaviorally, kids who spend time outdoors during the school day come back to the school setting more focused, ready to learn. 
Um, and um, there are decreased behavioral problems. Sometimes people are fearful that if they have too much time to roam outdoors during the school day, there'll be behavioral problems outside, and there's evidence to suggest that that doesn't really happen. And then there's also evidence to suggest that when they come back into the classroom, they are better able to focus and make better use of, of the rest of their day indoors. Developmental outcomes, broadly speaking, um, cognitive development, um, executive function, which are skills like impulse control, planning, and foresight, those regulatory skills that we talked about, problem solving, all controlled by the frontal lobes of our brain. Um, social development also fall, falls under this developmental category. Things like learning how to collaborate, cooperation. These are um, skills that you develop when you are outdoors playing and learning with others in groups. Leadership development, some of the same sorts of skills like collaboration, cooperation, but also communication, conflict resolution, those sorts of things. And then personal development, more that sense of identity um, and uh, self-knowledge, development of aspirations about what you want to do educationally or vocationally in your life. And then conservation ethic is a really important one that I know you all care about. Um, we protect what we love, and awe and wonder are incredibly important emotions to feel in order to develop that sense of love. We're not going to develop that unless we're really spending time and getting familiar and having experiences in nature that allow us to develop that sense of awe and love. To love something, you have to interact with it. So there are some barriers. Um, despite all these benefits, um, we are increasingly running into barriers. And one of the big ones has to do with how we as a, a society are thinking about risk. So um, we're in a litigious society, basically, and parents, schools, daycare centers, community centers have fear of liability issues. Um, Sometimes that's founded, sometimes it's not founded, um, and I think that education is really warranted to understand what are the relative risks of a free play in nature sort of approach to school recess or you know, after school programs, um, because there's less risk than you might imagine. There's also um, an attitude towards essentially protectionism. Um, parents, you know, more and more are protecting their kids from Certainly injury, of course, but all sorts of challenge and hardship. And the downside of that is that kids really need to experience taking a little bit of risk, doing some things that are challenging, failing, skinning a knee, you know, those sorts of things, in order to figure out how to take risk appropriately, how to get up again when you fall down, that sort of sense of resilience. Um, you don't develop those things unless you have some experience um, with them. You need to experience consequences, basically. Figure out what you're capable of and what you're not capable of. And then there are some damaging trends happening um, in our society. Um, you all, I'm sure, are aware that more and more we're cutting recess. Um, we're cutting out recess, um, or at least cutting back on it. Um, we are spending more time in the seat preparing for tests. Um, basically, the idea is that the more time you spend in your seat, direct instruction, the better you will do academically. When in fact the research suggests that that's not necessarily true. Um, that you can actually learn um, and perform better in school and on tests when you have sufficient outdoor time. Particularly doing school outdoors um, and having outdoor time during the day. Parenting practices have also changed. We're, we've talked about the protectionism issue, but there's also the overscheduling phenomenon. And some of that is um, a necessity. You know, two working parents and kids need to be in you know, after school activities or you know, summertime activities. Um, and there's plenty of options, um, particularly in the metro area, to, to just have a lot of different kinds of activities. But sometimes it's more about either a competitive attitude or a sense that to do a good job as a parent, you need to really offer all of these things. You need music lessons and sports and you need this and you need that. And some of that is great, that's certainly enriching, but not to the point of overscheduling and you know, basically saying to kids, you know, downtime is bad, playtime is a waste of time, being outdoors is a waste of time, because that's developmentally inappropriate. That's you know, counteracting the, the positive developmental benefits of being outdoors. Devices are another issue. Um, you know, 
Most kids have some sort of device, whether it be a cell phone. Lots of kids have multiple devices, um, you know, iPads and laptops and phones, gaming devices, that sort of thing. And they're spending increasing amounts of time with them. That's the downside. Devices can be great. They ease our life. You can learn from them. Um, and we can also make use of them in getting kids outdoors. You know, we could use them for geocaching, GPS functions. Um, there's apps for things like identifying song, you know, songbird songs and, and things like that. They can be harnessed as a great resource. Um, but typically, they're used in a way that is a little out of control and really deprives kids from having other kinds of experiences, particularly outside. There's a great quote in Richard Lube's book, Last Child in the Woods, that says, um, so I think it's a, a young child, um, who has questions about, you know, why do you want to spend time indoors instead of outside? And he says, well, that's where the electrical outlets are. Oh. <laughs> that's really sad. <laughs> okay, so what can be done? So, um, and who can do it? So I'm going to frame this in what's called the ecological model. Those of you who are social science people have probably heard of the socio-ecological model by Yuri Brock and Brenner. And this is an adaptation of that specifically for the idea of kids' exposure to nature and the benefits of kids' exposure to nature. There are proximal influences on that exposure, things like what parents do, what a specific teacher does, what a specific pediatrician does, something like that, some, somebody who has really direct interaction with that child. And then as you get farther away from that center circle, the influences become more <coughs> distal. So the middle one is about community, you know, our education school in schools in our community. Our neighborhood, is it walkable, is it safe, you know, things like that. Is there nearby nature? Um, what are faith communities, what's out of school time or youth development programs doing about getting kids outdoors? And then there's the distal circle, which is more about what policymakers do, what the media does, what our social norms are, what culture dictates to us. So we're going to take three examples, one from each of these circles, and examine that a little bit farther. <coughs> so let's talk a little bit about um, the family circle. So what can parents do? Parents can play. You know, starting from a young age, it's important to play with children, particularly outdoors. It's also important to encourage free play in nature, not overly structured play. Sometimes it's important just for parents to get out of the way and let kids play the way that they want to play, using the sticks and stones that they, they want to play with. Just making sure there's, you know, child isn't running away or that sort of thing. But even as kids age, it's important for kids to continue to be encouraged to play, to continue to be encouraged to play outdoors in a free play sort of way, and for families to play together. And it can start in your own backyard with young ones and get a little bit more adventurous um, as kids get older, going to nearby green space, which there's a lot of in the metro area here. Um, but then getting more adventurous, going to city parks, regional parks, state parks, national parks, wherever. But you don't always need to go to you know, the backwoods, the wilderness, in order to have these experiences. There's a lot that can be done with the nearby nature in our community. Parents also make decisions about how their kids spend their time, um, what kind of enrichment activities they give them, what schools they choose for them. So parents can look at the choices that they make with a lens towards, is this going to help my child experience nature in a way that's going to be developmentally enriching? Is this something that's going to allow some play, some learning, some free play in nature? What kind of a summer camp is this? You know, what kind of school is this? Is this a school that's going to cut back on recess? Or is this a school that really takes environmental education seriously, field trips seriously, playing outdoors, learning outdoors seriously, et cetera? And then you can also make decisions about like the bigger investments. Um, one of the best investments I think our family has made, well certainly school was a, an important decision, but um, as far as out of school time, the best investment we made was starting to send our kids to YMCA Camp Minogen. Widgee is another, uh, another one that's sort of a sister camp, although a rival sister camp. Um, and they have progressions where kids start with a sort of gateway experience, you know, a few days in the Boundary Waters or something like that. And as you get more experience, you work your way up to the end point, the end of the progression is being out in the wilderness, totally disconnected for 40 or 50 days at a time. My son just returned from an Alaska hike um, in the Brooks Range Mountains for a 44-day hike. 
um, which was an amazing transformational experience that had been building for years. When he returned, he had an idea. This is the kind of college I need to go to. This is the place I want to go to college in. I need a wilderness, I need wilderness access. This is my happy place. Um, and I know what I want to do with my life. And he's, he's got a sort of career, career trajectory in mind um, at this point. So these can be incredibly transformational experiences. Um, and parents need to not necessarily choose that, but, but think with the lens towards what can we do to help our kids really deepen their engagement with nature. So let's talk about the middle circle here, the, the community circle. You know, what can schools do? So I want to talk a little bit about a concept that's called environment as the integrating context for learning. And this is the idea of using the environment not in a traditional environmental education way, where most of the focus is about learning about the environment, but this is about using the environment in order to learn about all sorts of other things. Okay. So it's really the idea of taking school outside. Some of these are obvious. You know, you can do science and you can do environmental studies and that sort of thing outside easily. You go do water quality testing or turbidity testing or that sort of thing. There's an obvious application for that. But there's a lot of applications in nature for other subject matter as well. So language arts, nature is so inspiring. Think about all the books that have been written that are you know, inspired by nature, nature adventure, you know, challenge, those sorts of things, poetry, et cetera. Kids get inspired by being outdoors, their writing, the creativity in, is increased, they can write poetry, they can journal, they can read outdoors, um, they can read about the place that they're in. You know, schools choosing field trip locations wisely can make use of an incredible resource, and I'll talk a little bit more about one in a minute, but the, um, for instance, the confluence of the Minnesota and the Mississippi River is really rich from a scientific standpoint, from a historical standpoint, um, from just sort of a, you know, the literature that's been written about it. You can study pioneers and fur traders and Native Americans and all sorts of things. And that place becomes an important place for studying language arts and the humanities. Math is another thing you can do outside easily. You can measure things and count things and record things. You can go back to the classroom put this into you know, Excel spreadsheets and graphs and you know, write reports and lab reports and that sort of thing. There's all sorts of interesting things that you can observe in nature, geometry, patterns, that sort of thing that relate to math. But the really cool thing happens when you think about the intersectionality of all of this and you think about doing school outside in a transdisciplinary sort of way where that environmental context is this integrating place where skills across all subject matter can happen. Common themes can cut across various parts of the subject matter. Um, and basically, all the teachers can sort of work collaboratively to enhance a really deep, deep interdisciplinary learning experience for, for the child. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of an example from my own children's experience. Uh, they went to the Friends School of Minnesota, which is a, a great at environmental education and great at place-based education. And they take their middle schoolers every single month to Crosby Farm. It doesn't matter what the weather is, everybody's going. And they do school outdoors that day. And it's very sort of you know, intertwined. Um, at the beginning of the year, the kids come, they map out using survey instruments a plot of land that becomes their plot of land for the entire year. And they all might do all sorts of calculations <coughs> related to that, you know, area and you know, those sorts of things. Then they might start working with their science teacher doing things like counting species or counting scat or something like that. Doing projections, I remember one thing they did was um, counting deer scat and sort of extrapolating to what does that mean about the deer population in this part of of Crosby Farm. Um, the language arts teachers, humanities teachers would then come in and they would do writing activities and art activities and um, journaling and those sorts of things um, in combination with whatever the themes were that they were studying um, you know, ac across all of the subjects. It was an incredibly rich interdisciplinary sort of activity and they would come back month after month and it would be sort of a different theme um, each time but the teachers <coughs> would work together in a way that cut across all of those disciplinary barriers. Um, and I can tell you that this is an, an incredibly important memory um, in my kid's life, and I think certainly one of the best learning opportunities they've had um, when they were in the K-8 environment. I'll give another example. I was um, 
privilege to be along on a trip that Wilderness Inquiry did with a set of teachers from St. Paul Public Schools from K to through 12 in all sorts of different disciplines. And it was a place-based education teacher professional development program. And we spent a week paddling the Mississippi, visiting Crosby Farm, being at the confluence of the Minnesota and Mississippi rivers. We were doing water quality and turbidity testing. You know, we were basically teaching the teachers how to utilize these environmental settings in order to teach their subject matter, but also how to work across disciplines. These teachers got really excited and are sort of together as a cohort this year, figuring out how to implement <coughs> lesson plans that are informed by this place-based um, modality, but also beginning to realize they could do some team teaching you know, across subjects, um, and they, they are enriched, they are enlivened by doing that, and they're seeing the, the impact that it's had on the kids as well. They are really engaged in the learning um, and learning lots of interesting things. Another thing that is maybe not so academic, but um, nature can be used as a way of really calling kids to action. And this is another example from the Friends School. Friends School is located near Hamlin University, right across the street from a mini arboretum. And one day, the kids were outside at recess playing in the arboretum and noticed that all these trees had the circle paint around them marked to be taken down. They were outraged. They developed a tree committee. And there we have it. You got, you, do you know what happened to the trees? Come talk to the, the tree committee. And the teachers picked up on this and said, let's figure it out together. So they called in a city arborist. They talked to people who were planning. Um, they basically helped the kids understand what diseases are in trees. They helped kids choose. The kids got to choose what the next trees would be. They helped plant the trees. It was an incredible moment for them to really learn all sorts of things about trees and um, about the health of trees, but also to realize that they can have a voice and that adults and policymakers and planners will listen to them when they express concerns. That was incredibly empowering. Okay, on to the last sector, which is what can policymakers and planners do? And I'll just give you a couple of examples of how folks at this level, at more distal rung, can think about a lens related to kids and families and nature. We in Minneapolis in particular have a guideline, I don't think this is a statute or anything, but there's been a, a guideline for many decades that basically has said everybody should have access to green space. You should be six blocks away or a 10 minute walk away from green space. It should be accessible to every citizen in our community. And if you see all of those little red dots, we're not doing too bad. There are some places where it's not a six block or a 10 minute walk, but, but pretty good. Another example is Chain of Lakes. Um, it's connected by 34 miles um, of dedicated bike lanes. Biking, running, hiking, paths, this sort of planning is you know, what we're talking about when we're asking the folks who are making decisions about <coughs> what our urban and our green space within our urban area is gonna look like. How can we do this sort of planning so that folks can take advantage of it? And then what can you do? Um, you can certainly act as a parent, or a grandparent, or a niece, uh, uh, was say niece or nephew, aunt or uncle, sorry, um, in, in the ways that we talked about in terms of you know, taking care of kids and encouraging their play. But you can also get involved in more of those action-oriented sort of things. You know, think about decisions that are things you can vote on, or candidates um, that you might vote on. Ask them questions about their stance on education issues and environment and recess and, and things like that. Um, you can also get involved in some movements or some organizations that might keep you connected to the issues. And I just want to point out two of them here. Um, the top one is the local Minnesota Children and Nature Connection, which is a, sort of a coalition of professionals from a diverse set of uh, disciplines and sectors, people from health and education, state agencies like Department of, Head of Education, Department of Health, um, REI, Early Childhood, Nature Centers, um, uh, the zoo, et cetera. And we come together, we have come together for about eight years or so to find ways to work with other professionals to enhance their capacity to work with kids in nature in this way that's gonna really benefit them. The free play in nature, unstructured <coughs> play, learning in nature, that sort of thing. And then, um, and then there's a national organization that I'm gonna allow Sarah milligan Toffler, my colleague here, um, to talk a little bit more about. But I heard somebody um, mention the Richard Louvre book, Last Child in the Woods. Richard Louvre was the co-founder of Children in Nature Network. Um, and we were lucky enough to have the now current executive director living in Minneapolis, so she's a great resource. 
Um, Sarah, I'm going to just show our contact information, <coughs> but if you want to step up and just give a few comments about um, anything you're thinking about national scene or um, anything you want to share about the Children in Nature Network, and then we'll open it up to, to questions and discussion. Thank you. Can you hear me? Am I on? Yeah, yeah, okay. <coughs> well, thank you, Kathy. That was a really helpful description. And I, I just want to point out, I think, a couple of things. Um, the trends that Kathy mentioned about the disconnect from nature are things that we're not just seeing here. This is national and even international. Um, some studies suggest that kids are spending up to 60 hours a week indoors. <coughs> it's a full-time job. You know, it's a, it's a big deal. Um, and, you know, I think um, there are a couple of trends, you know, Kathy pointed out a number of trends that, uh, you know, are kind of creating this perfect storm um, of why childhood has moved inside. Um, but one of them I think that's really important for us to understand is that um, urbanization. For the first time in human history, more people live in cities, that we know of anyway. More people live in cities than live in rural or suburban areas. So it used to be, I mean, and I'm guessing, you know, maybe for, for, for some or many of you in this room, a connection to nature was just part of growing up, right? It was just where you lived, if you wanted to eat, you know, you had to kind of understand how things worked. And it's not like that for kids today. Kids live in cities. So I think we really need to be thinking, um, uh, rethinking about how a connection to nature happens just in your everyday life, in children's everyday lives, where they live. You know, it's that, that nature that's right in your backyard, right on your way to school, right on the schoolyard, um, at libraries, you know, all the public spaces and, and so forth. And I think, you know, one of the things that we're thinking about at the Children and Nature Network is not only the physical infrastructure of parks and things like that in cities, but what's that human infrastructure that's in place to uh, support a connection to nature. We see a lot of things where there may be a park in a low-income neighborhood, but the families in that neighborhood don't use the park because they don't feel safe sending their children there. So that's, th that's something we, we really need to address, I think, from a systemic standpoint. Um, I think just a couple things about the Children and Nature Network. Um, uh, anybody here familiar with the organization? I just want to see kind of, okay. so. So kind of, uh, kind of some familiarity. We are, as Kathy mentioned, the national organization that's work an international organization. That's um, uh, we really invest in in leadership and local leadership, uh, grassroots leadership on this issue. So we provide tools, information, resources, training, and try and bring people together. And then also to kind of work in that outer circle that Kathy was pointing to to try and figure out what are the big levers that we need to be pulling. Um, to, to, to create a different environment where childhood can move back outside. Um, so we have, uh, we'll be announcing actually next week a major partnership with the National League of Cities. Uh, Mayor Coleman in St. Paul has helped us make this connection. Um, so we'll be launching a three-year pilot to be looking at, you know, how does a connection to nature happen in cities? What can mayors do? And we'll be creating some community action plans around that. And so. Uh, I'm quite certain St. Paul uh, will, and hopefully the whole Twin Cities will be part of that. Uh, so there'll, hopefully there'll be opportunities for those of you that would be interested in getting involved at a local level on that issue to, to get involved. So um, you can go onto our website and, and uh, log on to, um, to join our action alerts and new, you know, get our, our e-news and, and you'll get information about that. Um, Do you so want to say anything about the National Conference? Um, yes, um, thank you, Kathy. Um, and I did bring some information about that, which I can pass out. But um, we are hosting our first um, really national conference in April um, of 2015 in Austin, Texas. So great place to go in April from Minnesota. Um, and uh, it, the, the conference is called Inspiration and Action for Healthy Communities. And we're really going to be focusing on that connection between health and wellness and a connection to nature. And looking at that as how does that happen in cities, what can, what can health professionals be doing about that. 
and then um, looking at, at education, the education sector, and then really how do we begin to engage the next generation of leaders in this, in this issue and topic. Um, so I do have some information about it. The registration is open and we'd love and you know, really uh, welcome with open arms anyone to, uh, to attend that, that conference. It should be really exciting. So, um, at this point, if we'd like to open it up, I think we'd like to open it up for questions that any of you may have for either Kathy or me, um, or great ideas or suggestions of things that you're seeing work out there. That's a great question. I'll take a first stab and then you can um, Answer. <laughs> this is a question that the Children and Nature Network has been asking because you know the the fears that parents have are real. Um, I <coughs> I have them, <laughs> and I know. Um, and you know it, it's interesting. There's um, uh, people looking at there's a, a concept called a roaming radius. Um, and when I was a child, the roaming <coughs> radius for children was about a mile from home. It's now measured in feet. So it's an interesting deal. So, and, and the, the fear factor is just something that I think we have to deal with. Some of it is, is real, some of it is just perceived. But um, one of the things that the Children in Nature Network has done is put together a toolkit. You can download this from our website for free called uh, Family Nature Clubs. And the idea is that a, a parent who thinks, hmm, I want to do something about this can create um, uh, just invite their friends and neighbors and families to meet up at the park every Saturday and, and create um, create safety um, in numbers by you know kind of self-organizing. Um, so that's one way. I do think that um, certainly more um, you know parents can certainly encourage more opportunities <coughs> just to connect with nature at school and be demanding that from 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 their schools. Um, those are kind of two ideas off the top of my head. I don't know if you have thoughts, Kathy. Just to expand on the, the Family Nature Club idea, um, there are a couple of them in Minnesota. And actually, if you go to the childrenandnature.org uh, website, there's a great map that you can use to search um, and see you know, what's, what's happening in different states. And you'll see that there's a couple of them um, in Minnesota. But we certainly need more because they're very localized. You know, I mean, the idea basically is a parent who organizes this you know, has an email list and there may be hundreds of people on that email list and they say, you know, we're going to meet, you know, our family is going to meet at William O'Brien or you know, wherever at this time um, on this day, come join us. And they have scouted the area, they can be sort of the ambassador to families that maybe have not been there before or a little bit reticent to, you know, let their, their child run down the trail or whatever and just sort of be a good role model. Um, so family nature clubs I think are, are really important. Um, not every family is going to join, you know, a family nature club or start a family nature club. Um, I, I am reminded that there's a ton of child development literature, um, popular literature out there, that somehow could be brought together to address this issue. There's, there's information about the overscheduled child. There's information about, there's a great book called The Blessing of a Skinned Knee. And it's that idea of letting children take a little bit of risk, understanding what the consequences are. You know, taking some of this popular information that sort of touches this issue but isn't directly about this issue, pulling it all together and helping parents see the, you know, the, the big picture, um, how all of these sort of child development practices really um, can be brought together to impact, you know, kids in nature. And there are some resources on the Children in Nature Network website and probably, well, maybe soon to be on the Minnesota yeah. Children in Nature. Um, but there are some resources about this uh, on our site that could <coughs> help with what Kathy's suggestion is uh, about what that, you know, what that pop popular literature is. First of all, I think it's also really important to remember that all of those activities do offer financial aid scholarships that can be more affordable than it looks um, by sticker price. Um, but even so, it is it costs money. That's absolutely true. Um, I think it has more to do with you know attitude and information. You know, when there's a park six blocks away, or there's you know 34 miles of trails you know in your your backyard. 
it's really about knowing what exists and feeling comfortable. And um, I think that that's making use of those free resources and maybe <coughs> teaming up with others who want to explore those as well. You might not be willing to go do that yourself, but if you invite another family to come along, make it a, an adventure, you're more likely to go explore the trails in a park you've never been to before. Um, I think there are a ton of free resources. You don't necessarily need to do the things that are expensive. You can also advocate for the public schools and you know the, um, the public out of school time sorts of activities, um, after school care and that sort of thing, to pay more attention to this issue, to be more willing to get kids dressed in the winter, to go outside, to you know, not cut recess, you know, those sorts of things. It's about advocacy. So informing yourself, being willing to, to advocate and take a stand. And I would just add to that, sorry, before you. Um, <laughs> One of the things that we're doing at the at the national level is um, working, you know, with the YMCA. Um, so obviously, <coughs> so the the camps that Kathy mentioned are Y camps, but the Ys also have stuff in every community, as you know, programs in every community, after school programs that are are intended for um, low income children. And so we are working with them to uh, figure out and, and how we can support them in encouraging outdoor time and nature time in all of their programming. Um, so um, and supporting those kinds of efforts would be another way. Um, we actually, um, there's the World Parks Congress is happening right now as we speak, and um, Cheryl Charles, who was my predecessor as the uh, founding executive director of the Children and Nature Network, is there um, presenting on these issues, um, and you know, uh, working internationally. There's been she helped to get uh, an international um, uh, 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 proclamation on the rights of children, you know, for the rights of children to have a connection. So there's some things like that that are happening. Um, um, we are working um, internationally to take some of our tools. So like the Family Nature Club concept is one. Um, there's a, there are a number of people in Canada who are very, very interested in that concept and actually embedding it in their provincial governments to have that be something that you know every community has family nature clubs as part of just the normal way of life. So we're doing some work with, with Canadians on that. Um, I, I receive a lot of emails from people who live in China who are very concerned about this issue. And again, talk about urbanization, right? Uh, but but people are seeing uh, stress in their own lives and stress in children's lives. So at this point, um, I mean, I, I would say what we, you know, the, the main things that we're doing is trying to connect them to other people around the world so that they know that they're not alone and thinking this way to the information and research that's out there. Um, hopefully invite them to, to join uh, potentially at our conference. And then we've been translating some of our tools and resources. Right now we have, um, uh, our resources available, I think, in four or five languages. Um, so those are some of the things we're doing. It's not nearly enough, but it's a start. <laughs> That's another reason why it's helpful to um, to take another family, um, so that the, the adults have something to do and talk to, you know, someone to talk to while, while kids are doing more of the, the free play sort of thing. I just want to bring up, it's a great sort of toolkit kind of book that's about how to get kids outdoors, and it's very uh, parent friendly, um, and I'm, it's got the word green in it, that's all I can remember, so sorry about that. Patty Ford, Sally, S-E-L-L-Y. Well, I'll talk about the recent conference, and then maybe you can talk about the more national sure. level stuff. Okay. The, this issue of disparities um, uh, is really, really important. Um, last 
Wednesday, November 5th, the Children in Nature Connection held a conference um, that was about this exact issue. Um, it was about access uh, to nature and the, dis the sort of equity um, and disparities issues that we are plagued by. Um, two researchers, one from the Metropolitan Council and one from here at the Humphrey England Fan, presented research that demonstrated that the, the folks who are using, particularly our parks, that tended to be the, the focus of it, are like 98% Caucasian. And of course we know, particularly in our cities, that we are much more diverse than that and diversifying more and more every year. Something is amiss there. Um, and given all of these developmental benefits, we've got a problem brewing. You know, the more diverse our kids become, the less likely they are to be the ones that are getting into nature, the less likely they are to be reaping those <coughs> developmental benefits, and they will become the majority of our kids um, very soon. So we need to reverse that trend. Um, soon, um, there will be available the slide presentations from all those two researchers as well as a uh, uh, policy, I think, Ramsey County wonderful speaker who, who talked a lot about what's happening at Ramsey County. And I can make those available um, to folks. Um, they were great presentations. Um, do you want to talk a little bit more about what CNN is doing? Yeah, I can do that. I think I want to start first though by um, circling back to um, a, a program that you talked about earlier, Kathy, which is Wilderness Inquiry here in the Twin Cities. Full disclosure, I worked there for 25 years, so I'm a huge fan. Um, but you all should be too, because they are doing um, amazing work, uh, not only here in the Twin Cities, but around the country, um, to connect kids um, in the public schools uh, to nature. And they're actually uh, working, I mean, Kathy uh, talked about the program that she's working on in terms of training teachers, but they're also, uh, they uh, are running programs year round at North High School, for instance, and doing this whole engagement um, model around you know really just starting right where kids are not starting with like here's something you got to go learn something outside no let's just go paddling or you know exploring have some fun you know sleep out under the stars and experience that awe and wonder and then helping you know as kids have questions and get more you know interested and engaged you know providing opportunities for them to do more um, more um, intensive kinds of work so um, if um, I would, I would really encourage folks here, if you're interested in that equity piece, to check out how you might get involved with Wilderness Inquiry. I, they, they do trips every day in the summer on the Mississippi River, and you could get out there and, and help and volunteer and, and learn how you can get involved with that. On a national it level, is, as yeah. the, the name of that program is oh, called thank you. Yeah, Urban Wilderness <laughs> Renew Adventures, or UWCA, which sounds a lot like Boundary Waters. Um, it's supposed to. It's supposed to, yeah. <laughs> um, it, it, it's a tad hard to get to if you're on the Wilderness Inquiry website, but if you Google Wilderness Inquiry UWCA, you'll get right to the page. Yeah, yeah. it's a great, great program. Um, uh, nationally, um, this equity question is, is, a, is a big deal. And so there, there are a few ways in which we're dealing with that. Um, we have some national partnerships um, uh, with the Health Policy Institute, which is working on closing health disparities in communities of color around the country. And so we're working to integrate nature solutions into uh, their work. Um, we're working with Hispanic Access Foundation um, also to, to, do, to look at policy as it relates to um, uh, Latino connection to nature. Um, one of the things we've worked on with them, for instance, is um, establishing, um, I forget the name of it, there's a, a monument um, in Chicago that's very um, meaningful to African Americans, and so we, we helped to get that established as a, as a and it's a park that's, that's used heavily by, um, by Latinos, so working to make sure that, that it's getting federal designation and dollars and support, those kinds of things. Um, we also are doing, and this would be something uh, that you, all of you may have some interest in, in ability to help refer people to. We have something called the Natural Leaders Network, which is um, a training program for um, leader, young leaders, millennial leaders in this movement. And every year we hold a um, what's called a legacy camp. It's a th three or four day camp that um, young leaders, diverse leaders can apply to and they come and get training on community engagement, community activism, um, how, to, um, how to engage diverse people in this movement. Um, and, and 
Right now, we ha REI is underwriting that program, so the training is, is fully covered for young people. So I'd say that that would be something, if there are pe young leaders in this community that you'd like to engage in that topic, they need to nominate them to be involved in that. Well, I can tell you that I just got a phone call from the um, National Girl Scouts last week, and they, at their recent um, uh, national conference, um, recommitted to having a connection to nature be central to their um, strategic mission. Um, it has not been for the last few years, last number of years, and they are recognizing because of all of the things that we've talked about that it's critical um, to the healthy development of girls. Um, I think that um, there's uh, some interesting challenges around that. Um, I, you know, uh, I, I don't know whether their numbers are up or down. I can't speak to that, but I do know that they've committed to it. And I, I, it, I know it's central to the Boy Scouts as well. <coughs> but I think that those clubs have been struggling some with membership. I don't know. Um, uh, I'm not sure. And I think that you know pediatricians are recommend, and I'm I don't, I'm not a pediatrician, so I'm not going to give you the the uh, the recommendations. But the American Association of Pediatrics has set limits at different age levels for um, media time, and I think that would be something to recommend that parents follow those. Um, <laughs> and that's also all screen time, whether yeah. that be on a phone or a TV yeah, or a computer yeah. screen. Yeah. It's, it's everything. Yeah. Sometimes we don't remember that there's right. multiple ways to get screen time. Right, right. Um, it's complicated, though. I think. I mean, to your point, I, 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 it's a complicated thing for parents, and I was, you know, I don't know that that I haven't figured out. Um, I think. Um, you know, coming up with those opportunities. I know um, some families are doing something with that they call a techno fast, or you know, there's a period of time during the evening where all the devices get turned off and put away. So you can establish some routines like that, um, where there's time when you use it and time when you don't use it. Um, you know, I think um, obviously iPads can be great for having books. You know, like right at the ready. But also just, you know, sometimes just pulling out a real book, you know, I think can be a good, like knowing that that's an important thing too, that physical um, connection to, to, uh, to a book. Um, so um, I think we're all figuring it out, would be my answer. <laughs> but, you know, I think we, we, we can fairly well say that we've kind of swung pretty far in one direction and, you know, kind of don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater in terms of that. It's kind of like the more te technology we have, the more, you know, time with, you know, reality we need, you know, and that, that can be found in nature. <laughs> um, so I'm going to start backwards. So the first question you asked was about kind of the access. I mean, uh, the Trust for Public Land, I don't know if that's where you got your data from, Kathy, on the parks, but the Trust for Public Land has what they call the park score. Um, Minneapolis is, rates the best in the nation. Uh, we, it, wherever you are um, in Minneapolis, you are not more than a mile from a park. It's pretty impressive. So we're pretty lucky here. But there's the piece that I mentioned earlier, I mean, we have the physical infrastructure here, and obviously we can do better, but we do have the physical infrastructure. The question is, what's the human infrastructure <coughs> supporting getting people into the parks? There, we, we kind of need both. Um, 
And you know, organizations, again, like Wilderness Inquiry, I think, are part of the solution to that. The wives can be part of the solution to that. Schools can even be part of the solution. They can use the, you know, the, the, the public park system as their extended campus and learning laboratory. But it, you know, there just has to be a change in thinking about the importance of that and why, you know, um, why, why it would be important to have that connection and what the benefits are. Um, as far as the, um, the difference in terms of the issues in cities versus rural and, and suburban areas, um, maybe the issues are surprisingly the same. I think, you know, the barriers, um, one of the biggest barriers that we hear, and it's different for different communities, but this question of safety. And sometimes it's that, you know, there isn't a safe way to get from your house to the park because of roads, and a lot of suburbs don't have sidewalks, and you know, we're kind of built like that. So what are those connector routes? Sometimes it's, you know, I, in a lot of, um, I'm, I'm hearing in Latino neighborhoods, um, fear of stray dogs biting children, like that sort of thing is, you know, it, it prevents us from just sending kids out. Um, even in rural areas, you know, there's nature surrounds them, but there's this question of safety. Are we going to, you know, I mean, who in this room doesn't know Jacob Wetterling's nature? Right? You know, um, and so that, even though the incidence of stranger child abduction has actually gone down since the 50s, are very small. Uh, are, and obviously, one child is too many. I don't mean to minimize that. One, I mean, but. You know, that has struck in every mother's heart, every father's heart, right? That, that fear of letting your child go out. The, the technology is in most of the rural areas, so that screen time, that pull inside for that. Um, and schools reducing time outside. So that's happening in all, in, in both, in, in urban, rural, and suburban settings. So the issues in many ways are, are similar. I'm, I'm sure there are some differences that I'm will let me know about, but um, I don't know. Does that answer your question? Okay. Well, I'd like to thank you all for coming today.